In 479 BC, the Greeks under Pausanias defeated the Persians at Plataea. And afterwards, when they plundered the enemy camp, Herodotus writes, they scattered throughout the camp and found tents adorned with gold and silver, couches gilded with gold and silver, golden mixing bowls, libation bowls, and other drinking vessels. On the wagons they discovered sacks in which they saw cauldrons of gold and silver. So we see the spoils of war were substantial. But the next thing that the Greeks did was to exact retribution against the city of Thebes, because Thebes had taken the side of the Persians. In fact, Plutarch says that Thebes had zealously sided with the Persians. And Herodotus writes, After the Hellenes had buried their dead at Plataea, they at once held a conference at which they resolved to wage war on the Thebans and to demand from them the surrender of those who had Medized. Medized means to associate with Persia. Herodotus continues, They approached Thebes and prepared to lay siege to it, ordering the Thebans to give up the men. And one of the leading men in the city said that they should go out and deliver themselves. And these men were brought to Corinth by Pausanias and executed. It is possible that Pindar was present in Thebes during this siege. Pindar was a Greek lyric poet who Quintilian called by far the greatest for the magnificence of his inspiration. Pindar made a name for himself by writing what they called Epinesia, or Victory Odes, which honored the victorious athletes of the Olympic Games and which potentially involved some homage to the victor's homeland and a mythological reference. Pindar was a Theban, and there was a violent history between the Thebans and the Athenians. When Pindar was commissioned by the Athenian Megacles, and this is before the Persian invasion, all he gave him was one of his briefest poems, and that was well short of the praise he normally lavished. And to describe the friction between Thebes and Athens, we must go back to the period of the reforms made by Cleisthenes when Athens was invaded on both sides. A Spartan army came from the south, and a Boeotian army came from the north. The Spartans turned around and went home without a fight, leaving the Boeotians to deal with Athenian vengeance on their own. And Herodotus writes, The Athenians joined battle with the Boeotians and decisively overwhelmed them, slaughtering vast numbers and capturing 700 of them alive. The prisoners were placed in shackles and ransomed. And Herodotus continues, They, as in the Athenians, hung up the shackles with which they had been bound on the Acropolis where they remained even in my time. This could not have sat well with the Thebans. So no surprise then, 24 years later, Xerxes marches across northern Greece, bent on destroying Athens. The Thebans joined him. So after the great battles of the Persian Wars, the Greek cities, which had triumphed, now disputed with each other who was most worthy of the highest honors. Plutarch writes, the Athenians not yielding the honor of the day to the Lacedaemonians, nor consenting they should erect a trophy. Things were not far from being ruined by dissension among the armed Greeks. So as these Greek cities vie for their place of honor, Pindar's Thebes could make no claim of its own. And what might Pindar think about that when we consider that it is his bread and butter to glorify deeds through his poetry. It is his objective. He writes in Pythian 3, excellence endures in glorious songs for a long time, but few can win them easily. In the first Isthmian Ode, Pindar considers it a light gift for a man as skilled as himself to build up splendor in all men's sight. Or in Isthmia 2, Pindar writes, nor silence yet these songs. I did not make them that they might rest in sleep. So this is Pindar's mission to sing the honor of men and cities for posterity. With this as his calling, circumstances must have irritated Pindar. But the very next year after Plataea, Pindar gets an opportunity to write an Olympic ode to a victor from Aegina, the most bitter enemy of Athens, while at the same time a friend of Pindar's hometown of Thebes in Isthmia 8. Pindar writes things that could not have entertained an Athenian. Pindar decides to point out that Achilles was an Aegonetan. The lips of the poets have published to those who knew not of it 
the young strength of Achilles, cutting with the spear's edge the sinews of Troy that had fought him off in deadly battle as he did great deeds in the plain. Memnon, the mighty and impetuous Hector, others, chiefs among men, Achilles, the staunch Iacid, showed them Persephone's house, which is to say he killed them, and revealed the glory of Aegina and the stock he came of. Achilles showed that he was of Aegonetan's stock. So we see the emphasis not only that Achilles was from Aegina, it is written as though it was for Achilles to show himself worthy of being Aegonetan. And if we suspect that Pindar knew what he was up to, we might also amuse ourselves that the Athenians may have been a little sensitive about their lack of a heroic tradition. For example, none of the great warriors of the Iliad were Athenians. And we get a sense that this bothered the Athenians from the funeral oration from Pericles as quoted in Book 2 of Thucydides, just after the initial hostilities of the Peloponnesian War in 431 BC. He says, The admiration of the present and succeeding ages will be ours, far from needing a Homer for our eulogist, or other of his craft whose verses might charm for the moment. Yeah, who needs Homer, says Pericles. We might not believe him. And when he refers to other men of Homer's craft, I wonder if he refers to someone like Pindar. But there are still more lines in the 8th Isthmian Ode that are compliments to Aegina that an Athenian might not have liked, especially an Athenian of the same aristocratical political party as Aristides. Aristides, who had come to be called Aristides the Just, or Dikaeon, this was the man whose benevolence in comparison to Pausanias was responsible for the shift in allegiance of the Greek confederates to Athens from Sparta, which is related by Plutarch. The sea captains and generals of the Greeks, in particular the Chians, Samians, and Lesbians, came to Aristides and requested him to be their general and to receive the confederates into his command. So Athens was now the great hegemonic power of the Greek-speaking world. And if they believed that they were possessed of a certain virtuous quality, which made them suitable for this leadership role, Pindar grants that same compliment to their rivals. Isthmian number 8 praises the legendary reputation held by Aegina for its sense of justice. He writes, they were temperate men with discretion in their hearts, a thing remembered in the assemblies of the Blessed Ones. The name Aegina refers to the woman who was impregnated by Zeus. And you, Aegina, Pindar writes, bore to the Lord of the loud thunder the best of men on earth. Brilliant Iacos. He was judge among the divinities, even. But the real meat of Isthmia 8 is this mythological example of the employment of good justice. Pindar writes, When Zeus and bright Poseidon came to strife over Thetis, each desirous to be wed to her beauty and possess her, the passion was on them. But the will of the gods did not accomplish such union, for they had heard things foretold. Themis, lady of good counsel, rose up among them and spoke how it was destined for this sea goddess, as in Thetis, to bring to birth a lord stronger than his father, to wield in his hand a shaft heavier than the thunderbolt, or the weariless trident, if she lay with Zeus or his brothers. Let her go. She must come, rather, into a mortal bed. So at a time in Greek history, when Athens is imposing itself on all its allies and these Greek island states. Pindar tells a story of how even the gods relinquished their pursuit of every last thing. And why? Because if they had over-pursued their covetousness, they would have given birth to one who would overthrow them. It is a warning from Pindar. And the historical circumstances might show us why Pindar felt justified in issuing this warning. Plutarch writes of Themistocles, he, as in Themistocles, was burdensome to the Confederates, sailing about the islands and collecting money from them. And Aristotle writes that the Athenians treated the allies too masterfully. 
And in the coming decades, when under Pericles, the Athenians will make burdensome exactions on all of their allies, Plutarch will quote Pericles as saying that the money is not theirs that give it, but theirs that receive it. And by the time of the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War and the speech of the Corinthians, as quoted by Thucydides, the Corinthian embassy says this about Athens, We know what are the paths by which Athenian aggression travels, and how insidious is its progress. To describe their character in a word, one might truly say that they were born into the world to take no rest themselves and to give none to others. So if it is Pindar's purpose to take shots at Athens by granting those compliments that the Athenians covet most to their rivals, he is definitely being a little passive-aggressive about it. And you can see this tactic socially, uh, particularly in a relationship. Have you ever seen somebody who, rather than criticize their partner to their face, will wait until someone else is in their presence and then compliment some attribute about them that they wish their partner would improve? That's a little bit like what Pindar is doing here. But in Pindar's case, he is not being so petty as that because he's a poet and he can't change the order of things and he can't rob Athens of its hegemonic superiority. So this is what he does. And he discusses in Pythia too. He says, it helps to bear lightly the yoke one has taken upon one's neck. And in this case, the yoke being Athenian power and kicking against the goad, you know, becomes a slippery path. May it be mine to find favor with the good and keep their company. As in, there's no point in directly offending our masters, the Athenians, so the best thing to do is to go find those good people in the world and befriend them. And of course, it is easier to find those good people in Aegina, the descendants of their progenitor, Iacus. That same Iacus, who is considered a temperate judge even amongst the divinities. That's why he writes in Nemea 3, I say we must bring music to Iacus and his race, for highest justice attends the saying, Praise the good.